thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, just before I launch into what is an amazing project, as Paul said, uh, I'll just give you a little background about me. Um, so I am a PhD student here in the UCD Space Science Group. Um, and I began my PhD last year after doing uh, my undergraduate uh, Bachelor of Science degree here um, as well in physics, with astronomy and space science. But going back to before that, um, I studied physics and technology uh, at Leaving Cert level. Um, always loved physics, maths, they were my bread and butter. Uh, that's what I went to school for. Um, but uh, they were my worst subjects. Uh, physics and maths were my worst subjects in the Leaving Cert. My guidance counselor told me I was crazy. I should have been going into English, Spanish, Irish, um, but I loved it and I knew I'd work hard at it, so that's why I suppose I'm here today. Um, and it was thanks to my physics teacher and teachers like yourselves that really pushed me to, to continue to study physics at uh, you know, undergraduate, no, postgraduate level too. So now it's not about me, it's about the project. So AirSat-1 is the Educational Irish Research Satellite. Um, so it's a satellite being developed by students and staff in UCD but it's a student-led project. So we've got 16 postgraduate students working on AirSat-1. Uh, we have three aims. Um, so the, the whole point of AirSat-1 is to be educational. Uh, so the aims are based around that. We want to train and educate um, postgraduate students like myself in uh, space, I suppose, satellite development, um, so that you have that expertise in Ireland. Also, to address skills shortages and to, I suppose, create a group of people who can contribute to the Irish space industry in the future. And also to inspire the next generation of students to study STEM subjects and also to get involved in space science. Um, so, the f I suppose, how did AirSat1 come to be? Um, so, we uh, in UCD have been sort of tinkering around with space detector development for many years. Um, then last year, uh, March of last year, uh, the European Space Agency Flyer Satellite Program opened proposals for um, university student teams to submit uh, projects, I suppose, to build uh, a CubeSat, which is a type of small satellite. We jumped at this opportunity and we submitted a proposal bringing together Irish technology from many different companies um, and lots of different disciplines. Uh, and they really liked it, they invited us over to the STEC uh, ESA Centre in the Netherlands uh, in May of 2017. Uh, we were selected as one of the six uh, student teams from all over Europe to be part of the second phase of the Flyer Satellite Program. And what does that mean? Well, they provide us with launch, which is really important, um, hopefully to the International Space Station, but it's not completely confirmed yet how we will get up there, but that's the plan. Um, and also they give us uh, training, uh, advice, they invite us along to lots of different workshops, um, and I suppose all, all along the way, they see how our progress is going, they give us feedback, uh, they keep us in check, I suppose. Uh, uh, it's an amazing program to be part of, to be able to work with people at the European Space Agency. So who are we? Um, that is the AirSat1 team as it stands today. Um, so we have 16 postgraduate students working on the project. Uh, we are from the UCD School of Physics, UCD School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering, UCD School of Electronic and Electrical Engineering, and the UCD School of Mathematics and Statistics. So it's, a, it's an interdisciplinary project. It was really nice for me to be able to start to work with engineers. Um, I always thought I didn't really have much of an engineering brain, but I'm finding that I really do like to build things, and I like, I like imagining how things will be. Um, and it was only through working with these people that I, I got to see that. Um, Rachel, actually, who is in, in here somewhere, yes, she's up the back there. Wave. <laughs> um, and we also have, we're led by fantastic um, academic mentors and uh, also industry mentors as well. So what is a CubeSat? Uh, a CubeSat is a miniature satellite. They come in units. One unit is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Uh, AirSat 1 is a 2U, so it's two of those stacked on top of one another, about the size of an average shoebox. Um, and CubeSats are really important in that they have really revolutionized the way that uh, people that don't have say, the means of a government or a big company to launch satellites into space because they're small. They can fit on rockets that are already going up there that have a little bit of extra space and they're cheaper than the usual satellite. But they are just as complicated because they have to do everything that a big satellite will do, but in a smaller space. So it's allowed for university uh, teams, uh, especially, 
to get really cool science up into space. And for example, there have been 870 CubeSats launched since 2000. So they're all, they've all had their time in space and it's time for Ireland to be part of that. So that's what AirSat 1 will look like. Um, so as I said, about the size of an average shoebox. Um, and it builds on previous CubeSat experience here. So we developed an educational program where you, uh, the, the students in the Masters in Space Science and Technology uh, interact with an, basically an interactive CubeSat. They get to see exactly how the different subsystems work, uh, but now we're actually building a real thing which is going to go into space, which is cool. We have three experiments, and each have exciting Irish technologies uh, involved. Um, first is called GMOD. GMOD is a gamma ray detector uh, developed here in the Space Detector Laboratory in UCD uh, under contract to ESA. It will detect uh, dying stars in space, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. EMOD um, is our second experiment. You can see it up the top of the, the structure, the four black and white panels. These are thermal control coatings developed by uh, Irish company NBio, uh, and they will fly closer to the sun than anything else uh, on solar orbiter, and they basically protect uh, the, the spacecraft from heat. But they've never <coughs> been tested in space before, so on AirSat we will find out how they react to heat in space before it flies on solar orbiter. And then our third payload is wave-based control. It's not physical, it's a <coughs> software payload. It, this software will um, take over control of AirSat-1's movement, and we will see how it works in space for the first time. So these are the different parts of, um, of AirSat-1. I like to call it the anatomy of the satellite. You can make analogies between the different parts of AirSat-1 and parts of the body. Um, but uh, you can see that kind of there's a, an awful lot going on. So on the top we have EMOD, as I told you about. You've got the structural frame, which I like to call the bones of it. Uh, the solar panels, which obviously provide um, power. Um, GMOD and EMOD are two experiments. Attitude, determination and control. Spacecraft's attitude is just its orientation in space. So we need to figure out where it's pointing and if we need to change its pointing. Uh, the onboard computer, which is like the brain. Uh, the EPS, which is the electrical power subsystem, which kind of keeps everything going. Uh, the battery, the comms, is very important, obviously. We need to know what's going on on the ground, so it needs to tell us, through the antenna, uh, exactly what's happening on board. So, to tell you a bit about what we do here, um, and how we made a gamma ray detector, um, I think I need to go a little bit through gamma ray bursts. So, gamma ray bursts are the most energetic explosions in the universe. They occur, on average, once per day, uh, and they happen uh, they are linked to events which happen when stars um, explode or collide. Um, and they are really interesting markers for the early universe because we can see them, I mean, they're so bright that we can see them very, very far back. So as you can see there, it says, uh, observed at redshifts up to 9.4. So they're really important for us to understand how the universe uh, has evolved and what happens in these really explosive events. So for many years, we have been studying gamma ray bursts uh, here in UCD, and that's what led to gamma ray detector development. Uh, and this is GMOD. So GMOD is um, a scintillator-based gamma ray detector. It's a very simple uh, concept. Uh, we've got a, a crystal scintillator, uh, which, oh, upon receiving a gamma ray, creates a little bit of optical light, and then a, a sensor, a silicon photomultiplier sensor, which is developed by Irish company Sensil, uh, which will detect that light, tell us the energy of that gamma ray, and send it back to Earth. And that's really, that's what GMOD does. It's a very simple, um, concept, but very difficult to fit into a very small space. Uh, so gamma ray detectors in space have always been very big, uh, requiring lots and lots of power. And that's why, say, um, uh, bigger satellites like XMM Newton are so big. We have shrunk it down into a really small space. <coughs> Hopefully flying this in space for the first time will prove that it is an effective way of detecting gamma rays in space and will simplify uh, bigger missions in the future. As I was talking about NBio, uh, the EMOD module, um, so these, t these two different coatings are called solar black and solar white, uh, and we will fly them in space first before they go on solar orbiter, which you can see there. Um, there are heat sensors on each panel, which will detect um, the temperature of each of the, uh, the panels in orbit as they point towards the sun, away from the sun. We will see how their heat cycles go and how they actually perform in real time. And wave-based control, uh, as I said, it's a software um, which will uh, control AirSat1's movement. Say, if it's tumbling, it will try to detumble 
uh, AirSat-1 in space and does this using magnet workers, so basically magnet magnetic fields which interact with the Earth's magnetic field. And this video just shows you how wave-based control works. So the middle one, or the one on the right, had wave-based control, the one on the left doesn't. So you can see how well it, it can control and, and stop any kind of um, out-of-control movement uh, of a system. And it's been applied to a couple, in simulation to a couple of different European Space Agency um, projects, but this is the first time that it will fly in space. So how do you build a CubeSat? Well, uh, there are some things that we can buy off the shelf. Uh, and they're called COTS components. Um, and we are buying them from a, a, a Scottish company called Clyde Space. Um, so these things we, we buy off the shelf, but that's not where it stops. We need to test them. We need to integrate them into the, into the system. Um, so it, although they are a little bit simpler and that we don't have to develop them ourselves, it's still quite complicated to integrate that with everything else. Uh, one of the things that we are developing here in UCD is the antenna deployment module. So what's interesting is that you've got a CubeSat, which is about this big. It needs to go uh, into space, but it can't, be, uh, it can't be very big because of the CubeSat deployers that we have up in space. They require that you have everything into this small little envelope, but you need an, an antenna, which needs to be about 1.5 meters long. So you've got to fit that into the structure and then deploy it later. So here in UCD, we have built this tape spring antenna. It's like a measuring tape. It is coiled up inside. Uh, upon launch, uh, it, the, there's resistors which are holding the doors uh, in place. Uh, the resistors uh, and, and the lines that are holding um, the doors in place, the resistors will burn those lines. They're almost like a string. Once the string breaks, the door opens, the antenna deploys. Uh, and that's how, that's really as simple <laughs> as it is. Uh, but obviously we hope that all four doors open upon launch because it's important that we get contact with our SAT-1. So that's what it looks like when it is deployed. Uh, and they will allow us to uh, contact the ground at UHF and VHF frequencies, which are amateur radio frequencies. So as I was mentioning about attitude, attitude is uh, orientation in space. I think this is a really nice concept to bring back to um, like students in the classroom because it's quite an interesting one. So we use magnet workers, which are basically coils of wire, which we pass current through, create a magnetic field, which interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and moves the satellite. Uh, and so uh, that's really how, it, you know, when, when AirSat-1 is thrown out into space, it's spinning very fast. We need to stop that spinning. That's, that's what does it, that's what stabilizes it. So it's a really nice um, little concept. That's something that simple can uh, control uh, a spacecraft in space. How do we communicate with AirSat-1? Well, um, as I said, we're using UHF and VHF frequencies, uh, which will communicate with our ground radio station here on the roof of the UCD School of Physics, just over there actually, um, which is really cool. It would be nice to have a mission control center here in UCD. Um, we received our hardware last week. I'm glad to say that that will be going up very, very soon. Uh, and we will have a couple of passes per day over Ireland. So uh, say three to four passes per day uh, in which we will have about 29 minutes of contact um, per day uh, to get down all of the data that we've collected on board, all the health data, make sure everything's going okay, but also send commands up to the spacecraft to tell it to detumble, to uh, change mode, et cetera. So it, it's, it's a quite a complicated thing to write all the software that is involved with that, and that's my role actually. So my role is the, the ground communication uh, on, on AirSat-1. Um, so as Paul was saying, we have an educational aspect to this project. One of those is just using social media basically. So if you follow us on Twitter at AirSat-1, we post a lot of biographies. So uh, as I said, the AirSat-1 team is so diverse. We have lots of different backgrounds, lots of different disciplines, um, and we're really, really big on, on gender equality as well. Uh, so I, I really like to try and showcase the different students that work in the project and their backgrounds. So I post biographies on there. We have over 800 followers. We've got lots of li different little updates. Anything that's happening, you'll find it there on Twitter. We have a website which recently has, has kind of undergone a very big update. Um, and one of the things that I really like about the website is the blog, which will keep you up to date on everything that's going on, our biographies as well, but also a forum. If your students have any questions at all, they can post on the forum and we will get back to them. Uh, I really want that to turn into a really big conversation. 
And we also do talks and school visits. So I, I've visited a lot of schools. Um, we've done talks at many different conferences. And we're also making a documentary, um, which hopefully will we'll showcase the whole journey. You know, it's a couple of years long, but it would be nice to document that, a really historic journey for Irish students. Um, we've created primary school resources on spaceweek.ie where we are running a competition to design a mission patch um, for AirSat1, um, which is and it's a really nice little resource, but we are currently developing secondary school resources. If you follow us on Twitter um, or if you keep, it, keep in touch on, on our website, we will keep you up to date on those resources. We will have some competitions as well. And hopefully, if funding allows, um, we are hoping to run from January anatomy of a satellite workshops here in UCD. Um, so keep in touch and, and we'll, we'll keep you up to date on all of that. So where are we now? We've just on Monday announced that we have passed the first stage of um, satellite development, which is design. So the design is sitting in a bunch of documents, which you can see there, um, very detailed documents that we've been working on for many months. Uh, so the design is done and it is accepted by the European Space Agency. We are now moving on to the build stage. Um, so actually what was involved in, that, in the design was that we had to, I suppose, write down what we want the satellite to do. That went off to the European Space Agency experts. They came back with feedback. And we went over to them in the ESA STEC Centre for face-to-face -face interaction with them and also to take part in lots of workshops. So we, we've learned a lot and it's really nice to be able to communicate with these experts um, quite often. We learn so much from them. So now we, build, build, we start to build the satellite, I suppose, um, and we are doing that here in UCD. In the School of Physics, we've built this clean room, which allows for, um, I suppose, an environment in which we can build um, the satellite in, in a clean way, and we, no contamination at all. Uh, so once it's built, we will test, and we will test each subsystem, each little bit, uh, separately, um, here and also at ESA facilities. So we'll do vibration testing, thermal testing, uh, you name it, we'll do it, um, and we will follow that all along the way while we build the prototype and then do the exact same thing to the flight model as well. So I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things that I never thought I'd get to do, um, but that are involved in this project. So I get to go to ESA centres and do workshops at the European Space Education Centre, where I've learned about operations, spacecraft operations, spacecraft communications. Um, also, we got to fly GMOD, our gamma ray module, uh, on a balloon in Texas at a NASA facility in which it went up to, I think, 700 kilometers or so. Uh, it, it detected gamma rays uh, up quite high and then it, um, it came back down again, which is really, really cool. Uh, it was a really cool experience for our gamma ray detector to fly closer to space but did I say 700 kilometers? I did, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> My apologies. Um, but yeah, to detect gamma rays up high uh, and come back down uh, and tell us how it will do closer to space. Um, we also, as I said, got uh, delivery of our antenna. That's going to go on the roof of the School of Physics. I'm going to have to put that up there soon enough, um, which is really cool. Um, and I think we're, we're creating these kind of resources in which we can show people what kind of courses we did. Um, which is, which is, I think, a really nice message to send home to students um, as well, because as you see, we came from many, many different kinds of courses, um, engineering, physics, maths, etc. Uh, one of the, the system engineer on the team has a background in architecture as well. So it, it, we, we are a very diverse group. Um, if your students are interested on Enterprise Ireland, there's a really good report on space activities in Ireland that includes courses, uh, Irish space companies, future Irish space opportunities. Um, we also, on the UCD physics site, have a really good resource for that too. And uh, ESA in your country uh, for Ireland has some great uh, information for that too. So this is the timeline so far. The moment we are beginning satellite production. Um, the next, uh, as you see here, ambient test campaign is starting basically tomorrow, the next day, Monday. <laughs> so, Ambient test means we have to test all of the satellite um, components in a normal environment, an Earth environment. Then we have to do environmental tests, which is testing it in a space simulated environment. Uh, and then hopefully, all going well, spacecraft delivered to ESA, uh, and then it will be launched, and we'll have one to two years uh, of operations in space. 
So uh, I'll leave it there, but um, if you visit our website, you can email us, admin at airsat1.ie, follow us on Twitter. Please do keep in touch. We have lots of stuff coming up. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. It has. Um, so we it's usually not used on bigger satellites because larger satellites, so we have a two kilogram limit. It can't be heavier than that. But uh, larger satellites don't have so much of a limit to move them in space. They put reaction wheels on board, basically heavy wheels which spin in one direction, the satellite moves in the other direction. We can't do that. They're far too heavy. Um, so we use magnetic, what's called magnetic actuation uh, only. But other satellites have used um, I suppose, I don't know the word for it, but have, have used uh, weights to move them in space as well. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. For that two-year mission, mm. would it be possible to track it via the computer so the students can see exactly where it is? Absolutely. ISS? Yes, so um, there's a, an open source software called gpredict, um, which the students can download and they can track it across the sky. You can use it now to track the ISS or whatever satellite you're interested in. Uh, and that's another part of this educational program is that uh, amateur radio um, is not so common uh, amongst young people nowadays. Um, and uh, we want to bring that into the classroom, bring that t uh, towards other students that, and also so that they'd be able to communicate with AirSat. Because it's on open frequencies. People can, people will be able to track it and will be able to receive um, what's called the beacon. Uh, the beacon is just a very simple message. But we'll be able to receive the beacon uh, open source. It, and w so we were hoping to uh, like run workshops here in UCD, but also that other schools can get in touch with it um, on a daily basis, So, which is really cool. Tom has a question. And you said it's going to last final two years? Indeed, yeah. After that, does it just get switched off or just back there or, or other things? Sure. So the, the two-year lifespan, it's actually not clear how long it'll be up there for. So this is also an interesting point. Um, Earth's atmosphere, the height of it changes with the solar cycle. When there's solar activity that we haven't predicted, the height of the atmosphere changes, and the drag that the satellite experiences is either more or less. So, it will either, so obviously the drag of the atmosphere slows AirSat-1 down, brings it closer and closer to Earth. Uh, it will burn up at some stage. Uh, in the atmosphere and it's gone. Um, but that's why we don't know how long it will last for. It really does depend on the height of the atmosphere. You're welcome. Great. Okay. Uh, can we thank Lana for a really interesting project? I think we'll all be watching. Thank you. Thank you.